I'm Jocelyn Kennedy. I'm the executive director of the Harvard Law School Library, and I'm really excited that you're all here with us today. So thank you so much for coming. This is our first book talk of the new year, and we're really excited. Um, before we begin, I need to thank the dean's office for providing lunch. So please enjoy your lunch. Um, continue to eat it during the presentation. Copies of today's book are on sale or will be on sale at the front of the room here. Um, and I think Dr. Gardner is going to sign some books at the end, maybe. She'd be happy to do that for you. Um, so that will be after our presentation. I also want to let you know that today's talk and the Q&A is being recorded. So you're on notice. You're being uncorded, recorded. And it should turn up on the law school's YouTube page sometime next week. So without further ado, it's my honor to introduce um, Heidi Gardner. Dr. Gardner is a distinguished fellow at the Center on the Legal Profession here at Harvard Law School. She's also a lecturer of law and uh, the faculty chair of our school's Accelerated Leadership Program executive course. She was previously on the faculty at Harvard Business School, and she has been awarded an international research fellowship at Oxford University Said Business School. I haven't read her book yet. I'm super excited to hear her talk about it. I've worked in a lot of different industries, and collaboration and de-siloing is incredibly important, so I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. I'm so delighted to be here and have a conversation with you today. I know you've got your mouths full. You're eating. Bon appetit. But that's not going to stop us from actually engaging in a conversation. I don't think that anyone really wants to be lectured at. Am I right? Yeah. OK, so we're, we're going to try and bring you into the conversation as much as we can. But first, let me allow you just a few minutes to get a, a couple of bites in and tell you what it is that we're going to be talking about today. My book is entitled Smart Collaboration. Now, that alone might trigger one of two types of questions. I find that it's often quite polarizing. On the one hand, you have people who say, collaboration, really? I hate working in teams. It doesn't feel like it's ever a smart idea. You may not be in this room if you think that, but I'd love to get some pushback if that's your point of view. But on the other hand, you get people who say, wait a minute, teams are all the rage. Collaboration is what we're supposed to be doing. Is it ever not smart? Well, the answer is absolutely. Collaboration can be time consuming and costly and feel risky. So unless you know why you're collaborating, it actually might not be smart. So part of what we want to be able to do today is pull apart all of the different kinds of contingencies. When do you want to collaborate? When do you not want to collaborate? If you're going to be in client service or you're in client service now, when do your clients actually care about this? That's a huge, huge determinant of whether it's smart or not. Because frankly, if your clients aren't happy with it, they may not pay for your work at all, right? They're going to, what's the word that everyone dreads? Overlawyered, right? That term. Nobody wants to just feel like you're lawyering up the bill. So, unless you can communicate why it is that you're collaborating in a way that the clients connect with and value, it might not be smart. All right, so that's the idea for the book. But I also realize that collaboration, the term alone, can feel like a soft topic. Right? It could be you know, big group hugs and kumbaya. It's the kind of thing we do and when we've got some extra time and our real work is finished. So in order to tackle that perception, what we've been doing, and by the way, I keep saying we a lot. You'll be pleased to know there's not more than one of me, actually. But I did have a whole research team that I've been working with for more than a decade at this point to try to get to the heart of what collaboration is. And besides, I'd be a real hypocrite if I write a book about collaboration and then pretend I've done it all by myself, right? So who's the we? Well, I'm working with some other tremendous academics right now at different institutions, some great doctoral students along the way, teams of mathematicians and statisticians to help crunch the numbers. And so coming back to this idea, is collaboration a soft topic? Well, with this team, we've uncovered some hard evidence to try to understand what collaboration is and what it isn't, and when it produces results, and how much it produces. So we've got statistical evidence. I actually have a few slides here today. I promise it's not going to be death by PowerPoint. But a few slides, because some people like to visualize data. 
So we took some of our empirical findings, the statistical findings, and we won't put big tables of numbers up there, but we'll visualize them in ways that I hope you can get your head around. All right, so let's talk about collaboration. Is it the same as delegation? No. Delegation is a hugely important skill. As you go on for, for you know, my students and other students who are here, I hope that delegation is a competence you will learn and develop sooner rather than later in your career. As you, you know, go into a, a law firm and you're working with teams of associates and you start to rise a bit through the ranks, understanding how to delegate work, how to take whatever has been you know, created as an assignment, as a matter, a transaction, and pull it apart into constituent bits and farm those out to different people. That kind of delegation, where you're simply disaggregating a problem and handing it out, that's you know, typically how delegation is seen. Critically important, but it's not the same as collaboration. Now, collaboration, we're defining in our book as the integration of specialized knowledge in order to tackle complicated problems that no expert could solve on their own. I told you we're going to make this interactive. So I'm going to ask you to turn to your tables, or if you're around the sides of the room, gather up and think for a moment about what kinds of problems in today's world whether it's problems that businesses are facing or just ordinary citizens, what kinds of problems today are more complicated, more multifaceted than they were, say, even three years ago? I'm going to give you a minute or so at your table to try and brainstorm a number of these ideas. When I put my hand up, that's going to be a signal that we're ready to come back together, OK? So over to you, what is more complex today than it was three years ago? Okay, let's come back together. Who has, a, who has an idea for some realm of our world that is much more complicated today than it was just a few years ago? Issues of privacy? Privacy, privacy, data security, cyber security. I mean, my gosh, that is as hot of a topic as you can get right now. And that was actually one of the top two issues that in all my research with client executives, so people who are buyers of professional service firms, whether it is legal services or consulting services or accounting or engineering, you name it, when I did lots of interviews with clients about what their top concerns were because of complexity, cybersecurity was almost always right towards the top of the list. There was one other area that business executives mentioned even more frequently than that. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Just shout it out. Discrimination. Discrimination. Well, these days, maybe even more so than ever. So um, I should tell you, this was um, research that was completed last winter into the early spring. Other ideas? And discrimination and other kinds of topics around human capital were definitely top of people's minds. 
regulatory and compliance. Regulatory and compliance, right? I mean, people were saying, even if it's a you know, small retail bank that was only operating in a couple of cities in you know, some limited jurisdiction, they were saying regulation was changing faster than they could keep up with it. What they really valued was somebody to come in and help them take a broad view over all of the different kinds of regulation, not just somebody who, say, a regulatory expert, but coming back to this idea of talent and human capital, somebody who could team up with a, a behavioral psychologist or other people who understood how people think and operate and make decisions. Because ultimately, if you're running an organization, you don't need the organization to be compliant alone. You need every person within there to understand what the regulations are and the impact on them. Likewise with cybersecurity, what we were talking about before, right? The threat landscape has become so complex. You've got hackers now entering organizations at virtually every access point. You know, the Internet of Things makes the whole supply chain vulnerable, for example. So now you don't just need security and IT people to tackle cybersecurity. You need human resources and legal and compliance, and God forbid you actually have a cyber incident, then you need your PR and your customer service and all of these other domains. You see why it is that people are worried about complexity in that way. So the world is becoming more complex, more, do you know this term, VUCA, V-U-C-A, VUCA, Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. VUCA, it's how a lot of leaders, workers, and just normal people feel about our environment these days. It's more volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous than ever before. So that's one trend that we see escalating a lot the uncertainty, the volatility, the complexity. That's all fine, except your knowledge, the knowledge of every kind of professionals these days is becoming increasingly specialized, narrow and deep. Why? Well, think about it this way. Knowledge is changing so fast that in order for you to say, I'm an expert in, well, you can't be an expert in these big, broad areas. You've got to define. You, know, you, you can't be an IP lawyer these days. Chances are, eventually, you're going to be prosecuting a certain class of patents for a certain kind of company in one jurisdiction. Right? Last week, uh, somebody gave me a, a great example. They were talking about their competitive set and how narrow it had become because there were very few other law firms that were able to offer FCPA investigations in mainland China for pharma companies in the local language. Talk about specialized, right? So you've got big, broad problems, narrow, deep experts. That is the argument for collaboration. All of those experts need to work together to integrate their knowledge across these different disciplines and domains and jurisdictions in order to tackle the problems. That's what we're talking about, collaboration. Do you have a sense now that it's not quite the same as big group hugs and kumbaya? Yeah? It is, uh, it's hard to accomplish. It's hard to accomplish, but it's what clients value tremendously. Let me share with you some of the data. Because when I'm talking with Lawyers probably more than perhaps any other professional group will say something like, I'd love to collaborate, but what's the pushback? My clients won't pay for it. Right? That's the pushback. I'd love to collaborate. I'm all for it, but my clients won't pay for it. That's why I'm a lone wolf. That's why I do everything on, you know, by myself or with a team of subordinates, the delegation issue. Well, let me share some data with you because we wanted to, to look at this early on and see if that was the case. So here is some pretty straightforward analysis. I tell 
people when I'm speaking to law firm partners and other kinds of professional service leaders, if you haven't done this already, you will increasingly be the outlier, right? This is a very common kind of analysis these days. What we did early in the research was we took data from two different global professional service firms. And we simply looked at their billing and account records. And for every client, we counted up the number of practice groups that served them, right? So it was you know, a, a set of clients where they served just by tax or by tax and employment, tax, employment, and IP, right? Very simple um, in the billing records to see how many different practice groups were working for that client. And then we took the revenue generated by each set of those clients and graphed it. And in this particular instance on the left, firm A, they had 10 major practices. And you can see the, you know, the increase here. We did it again, firm B, and the pattern didn't look terribly different. I can tell you by now we've replicated this analysis across more than two dozen different kinds of professional firms, and the pattern always looks pretty close to this. But I can see some of you kind of scratching your heads. There's a big kind of so what bubble <coughs> over top. You know, It's not rocket science. You don't actually need an MBA or a PhD to figure out that if you sell more services to a customer, they'll end up paying more, right? I, you know, business 101 here. But it's the pattern that is actually important here. Do you see that thin black line on the graph on the left? The, the blue bars are actual data, right? That's just billing data. That's how much money these clients were generating on average. But that thin black line that swoops upward, that's what the computer spits out when you say, show me an exponential curve. And the data fit it pretty well. So now, so what? What does that help you understand? Anybody want to interpret that? Yeah. Oh, that's a brilliant way to say it. Each extra practice adds more than, how did you say it? The previous one. So if you're moving from two practice groups to the third one, that third one doesn't add just what they would have done on their own. They add even more to that, even more to the mix. They're generating outsized revenues versus what they would have done on their own. And here's the really important part. If you would have been one of those partners in the, one of the first two practice groups, you would now be better off because one of your partners in a different practice group joined you. Why is that true? What do you think is actually happening? Take a couple of minutes at your table, because there are probably five or six different answers to this question. What do you think is actually happening that allows each practice to add more value the more other practices there are? I'll give you a minute. Turn to somebody and see if you can come up with a, a couple of answers. Can I give the microphone to this table? I'm going to let somebody take it. Keep passing it until you're the person who wants to speak. <laughs> Excellent. OK, so we're going to get some audience, uh, audience response at this point. Who ended up with the microphone over here? Fantastic. Melissa. 
So with the cl cross collaboration, it sounds like your expertise will benefit the client and it'll increase the scope of the overall product that you're delivering to them. And as this gentleman was explaining, that the, the client won't pay for it. Hurdle is mainly in the mindset of the law firm, so that's not so much to worry about. Okay, so one of the reasons that collaboration produces outsized revenues is that when people are working together, they're able to tackle these more sophisticated issues, right? They're not just tackling a, a real estate question, but they're bringing in somebody who understands the tax implications of that and somebody who understands you know, several different areas in order to give a more rounded, broader solution by identifying and solving more complicated issues. And clients are willing to pay for that. Did anybody come up with another reason why it generates outsized revenue? Yeah, please. Well, because we, we also think that it's, it's a complexity feature of that, so they can actually add more value by being more efficient across, across um, each practice group, so they don't have to do the work again and again and again. Absolutely. Now, this word efficiency is a bit of a funny one when it comes to collaboration, because inefficiency is often one of the first things that comes to mind as to why people wouldn't collaborate, right? I could do it faster myself. I don't have to spend time explaining to somebody else what it's all about. Even more than that, if they're from a different arena, we were having a great conversation before this um, talk started with some of the library staff talking about collaborating with the IT group, right? Really fruitful collaborations but what happens when you're working with somebody who comes from a completely different world, right? Their terminology is different. You have to understand the language they're using and the processes that they do and how they even think about what a problem looks like. So it can be really inefficient at first, but yet you're saying it can be more efficient. Can you say again why it's more efficient? Because sharing the information and know-how and so on and all the relationship management with the client, that's that's doesn't have to replicate across each of these groups, but it's already done. So each of the group is more efficient and then for adds more value and has a higher margin on whatever it's taking. Absolutely. I mean, this is where you want to put yourself in the client's shoes, right? Would they rather pay somebody who's encountering the problem for the first time all it takes for them to get up to speed and do the research and learn how this works and test some ideas <laughs> Or would they rather go to somebody who's possibly done a very similar issue, addressed a very similar issue in a different <coughs> arena, right? And so by collaborating, you can get sort of these, you know, the, the prior experience brought to bear, and it actually is more efficient. All of that hinges, of course, on your being able to find the expert, right? Find the person who's done it previously. There were some other hands up. What were some of the other reasons why you think that collaboration brings some of these benefits? Yeah, please. Each added group raises more questions requiring the other groups. That's what the client might hope for uh, because then there's value added from each group as they're answering questions. But the other explanation of the slide, which the client does not hope for, is that the exponential slope is because of the confusion and coordination and noise that creates no added value whatsoever. Absolutely. So clients these days are pretty sophisticated in deciding what they will and won't pay for. So they're going to pay for the value add. As this gentleman just said, one of the things that they're hoping for is that when, you know, when a team from a firm comes in and they're touching different parts of the business, that they will each start to spot issues and share business intelligence across the team so that they're able to say proactively to the client, hey, guess what? There's a risk around the corner that you haven't spotted yet but we're on your side, we're spotting it and helping you with it, right? That's ultimately what they want. They want people to be proactive. That's when you reach that you know, trusted advisor level, right? When, you can, when clients believe that they can rely on you to have their best interests in seeing these risks and issues and so forth, even opportunities. What they're not going to pay for though, 
and this is a huge issue, not just in law firms, but everywhere else, they're not going to pay for duplication of efforts or rework or some of the non-value add coordination that goes on behind the scenes. And I have to say, in a world of, well, they call it hourly billing, which is a complete misnomer, six-minutely billing, right? In a world where you're keeping track of every six minutes, it's hard to get into the mindset of investing the time on your own to have those coordination conversations offline. But it is an investment. It's an investment so that you're able to solve those complicated issues or identify proactively what some of the risks are so that you can do the high value add stuff, which really does lead to a lot of the, uh, the extra value and the extra revenue. Now, I am using a term here, perhaps I shouldn't even put it on slides anymore because I am trying to drive it out of the vocabulary of anyone purporting to provide professional services. Cross-selling is not the same as collaboration. With all due respect to people who are writing books on how to cross-sell better these days, but cross-selling is kind of a dirty word. Cross-selling is what happens if you're in there providing your kind of expertise, and because somebody has told you it would be good for you or your partners or your firm, you're trying to push some extra services at the client, right? For some of the clients, they've described that it feels like the legal or the professional equivalent of, do you want fries with that? Right? You've ordered your meal and now, oops, can I sell you a little bit more and grab some extra share of your wallet. Clients don't want that. They want you to understand their business well enough that you can actually bring in the right kinds of experts at the right time and solve those complicated issues. If you are only doing cross-selling, as in I'm gonna do the work I've always done and then I'm gonna introduce some underutilized partner so they can do the work that they would be doing as if they were practically in a different firm, they're gonna operate in their silo. If that's all you were doing, here's the revenue you would generate. That's what an additive function looks like. That's just one plus one plus one. If you've got people at the client who are working in their own disciplinary silos, their own practice groups, not sharing information and so forth. That's what it looks like. It's an entirely different kind of picture. And for some people, they're worried about, is every dollar a good dollar? In other words, yes, okay, maybe we're making more and more revenue, but what happens when a client starts to use all of our different practice groups? We're giving them more and more buying power, right? Aren't they going to demand bigger discounts from us? That's what a lot of practicing lawyers, especially if they're, you know, held, their feet are held to the fire for economic returns, they're worried about this. They're saying, well, maybe we're giving the client so much power when we've got these big teams in there that they're actually squeezing us in terms of profitability. Maybe that's not the right thing to do. I want you to keep just this sound bite in mind. A CFO of a major multinational said that not only did he know that he was overpaying for complex service solution, he said margins rise with complexity, right? We're willing to overpay. We know that the firm is making more money off of us when they're in there with five, six, seven different kinds of experts. We know that and we're okay with it. In fact, it's our strategy. He then went on to use a word that I think, if you haven't encountered yet, is a very vulgar word. Commoditization, right? It should make your ears burn when you hear it. Nobody wants to be providing commodity services, right? But if what you're providing is single disciplinary service, if you're in there, as the employment lawyer only ever speaking to the employment professional inside the client, only ever answering questions about employment issues, and you're not seeking out other kinds of experts, if you're not seeking out broader problems, eventually 
you're going to find yourself in the legal equivalent of a price war. Right? More and more procurement departments are coming into the realm of professional services. Procurement, which at one point was used to buy I don't know, gardening services and you know, office supplies, is now involved in important decisions about hiring external counsel. And they've got a real price war mentality, right? Um, if you're in my class, uh, uh, understanding law firms as businesses, we're going to be hearing tomorrow from the general counsel of GlaxoSmithKline. He runs a pretty innovative way to drive prices out of legal services, an online reverse auction. Wow, right? So if you're interested, let me know. I can you know, invite you to that class tomorrow too. But there is a lot of competition now in the legal arena, just like across all different kinds of professional services. And if you are in the realm of providing just a single kind of solution, unless you're the absolute guru, the world's best expert on that, and you really believe it's a standalone piece of advice, there's a chance that some client is going to see you as commoditized and essentially try and find your substitute in the firm down the street. You want to make sure you're avoiding that. OK. The question that should be on people's minds is this might be all well and good for the company, for the firm. You know, both the client and the law firm might be better off if the lawyers are doing this integration. But what about me, right? I've got a reputation to build. I've got a career to manage. I've got a bonus to justify. And you know, I dare say that the way we are producing and training lawyers, at least in this country, and I don't think it's terribly different, isn't going tremendously far. We're making good strides. But we've got a long way to go in helping people understand what's in it for them when they team up. So again, being nerds with a big data set on our hands, we tackled this one empirically. We wanted to understand what's in it for you when you are working in a more versus less collaborative fashion. What I'm going to show you right now is just a a mini, mini case study. We took two nearly identical professionals. I call them twins because they're so similar to one another demographically and professionally. They were in the same firm, the same practice group. They would graduated from law school the same year, so they were about the same age. They had both lateraled into this firm from a competitor, not the same competitor, but they had been with this firm for well over a decade, about the same amount of time, and importantly, they had billed the same number of hours in the year that we were investigating. So it's not like we're comparing one person who's a slacker and one who's a really hard worker, right? They're pretty similar to one another. And what we did was we took their timesheet records. And that allowed us to see, I'm going to take it at face value and assume they're accurate, right? So that allows us to see who worked with whom. And we don't actually, we didn't go to the, to the activity codes to see what exactly they were doing. But we set a pretty high threshold. We said if they worked for 15 or more hours on the same matter, right? They weren't working on two different projects in the same client. They were actually working on the same matter. And we can see that because they both build 15 plus hours um, jointly on that project. From those timesheet records, then, we can draw a network map to see who's connected to whom. So the Dots each represent a partner in the firm. The one who's our twin, the one that we're studying, is circled in red. And you can see he's collaborating with, um, what is that, six or seven other partners at that pretty high level, 15 plus hours in a year. And the lines connecting them are what shows that they've worked together. In some of the diagrams, we actually put little arrows so you can see who's generating the work and inviting somebody else to get involved. But a little simpler here, you just know that they're both working together in this regard. Now take a look at his twin. Remember, equally hard worker, same demographic characteristics by and large. Look how he's spending his time. OK, what's different? 
Couple of obvious things, one or two maybe not so obvious. What do you see? More lines, more people. Yes, this guy's involved with many more people throughout the day, throughout the year. What else? Yeah. Yes, that's hugely important, right? So they're also different colors. If you have really good eyesight, you can see that. So they're in different practice groups, and they're really connected with one another. Why does that matter? What, said a different way, what do you think twin number two can get from his network that's different or better than twin one? Please. Okay, so these are all partners right now. Let's come back in a minute to talking about what this would look like if they were pre-partner, okay? But I think your point is really well taken. Part of what happens when you've got a network like this is that your reputation spreads. And then what happens? What happens when more people know you inside a firm, inside a law school? What happens when more people know you? What do you get? Yeah, exactly. You get more referrals. They ask you to join their teams. Now, assuming you have a good reputation, right? Not all of this falls by the wayside if, you know, your reputation is one of not delivering on time with high quality. But these are all partners in a very reputable firm. So we're going to assume they have a good reputation, which means it's better for them to be connected to more people because their reputation spreads further faster. What else? Yes, absolutely. So you, you have more trust in the people that you're connected to because they've been working with other people, so their ideas are vetted as well. And if you need somebody, so the, the work might flow to you, right? Other people will have a need for you, and the work will flow to you because of your strong reputation that's broadly spread. But if you need somebody to work on your client project, the good news is whatever expert that is, is probably one, maximum two phone calls away. That's hugely important. There was a great piece of research done um, in a consulting firm, not my, not my research, but um, three academics took a look at networks inside a consulting firm. And what they found is that the world is differentially small for different kinds of people. Now, because it is so vital in a professional firm these days, whether you're billing by the six minutes or you're just under a lot of demands, your ability to tap into other people's expertise, right, that efficiency point that you made, being able to find somebody who's already done this and cracked it, the sooner you can find that expert, the more successful you can become. And what this other study showed is that people have different quality networks inside a firm. Who do you think is more likely, according to that research, and I think I believe it based on observation, who do you think is more likely to be sort of at the periphery, not as well connected inside a professional firm? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Newcomers. Newcomers, for sure. Yeah, newcomers. And they are hugely important, right? The labor market has heated up so much today, thanks in part to all of our brilliant executive recruiters that we have working in the legal industry that are making it easier and easier to find mobility and assets to, to fill holes. But the taboos have fallen away from moving between firms. You can read in any given day. You can pick up the legal press and you can see probably dozens of people who have changed between firms. If you enter a new firm, you don't have that network. So you have to build it, sometimes from scratch. Newcomers won't have that network. Who else? Uh, people who aren't at the job or maybe unpleasant people. Yeah, maybe unpleasant people. Yeah, so they get sidelined. Nobody wants to work with them. 
people who are shy, right? So they're not out there meeting new people and promoting themselves when they do good work. Can we get back to where we started? Um, one of the first answers was discrimination, things that are seen as problematic today. People who don't look like the core players in a firm end up on the periphery. In this piece of research in that consulting firm, women had much poorer networks. It took them sometimes multiple, multiple phone calls to find the expert, whereas Male consultants oftentimes only had to make one phone call before they were connected with the expert that they needed. Now, we could have a whole conversation on this, kind of spoiler alert. I don't talk about gender at all in this book. Okay, so if you're, if you're looking for the, you know, under G in the index, you're not going to find gender in there. Why? Because the results in our research between gender and collaboration are so provocative that we decided we needed even more data and even stronger tests before we were willing to write about them and release them. I will tell you, gender was significant in virtually every statistical model that we built, no matter what we were predicting, um, but we needed to, to dig a little deeper. Um, I'm gonna save some, some, you know, a couple of minutes here at the end for, for open questions in case you want to explore that one further. But what I'd like to come back to now is this idea that maybe you could get promoted sooner, depending which network you have. One thing I think you want to be careful of is before you have a strong reputation to spread far, you need to work on developing some very close relationships. It may be a better strategy when you're an up-and-comer to look more like twin number one. The, the critical word is sponsorship. You want to find some people who are credible and frankly powerful enough inside the firm that they can not only talk about your reputation, but advocate for you. You want them to sponsor you when it comes time to get promoted, to get plum assignments to get sent on some high profile outside piece of work. You want somebody there sponsoring you and advocating for you. And if you are spread way too thin, you may not have anyone pounding the table just for you. So what I'm about to show you right now is the business results that emerge for partners who have these two different networks. But the word of caution is, if you're trying to get to the partner level, you might need to strategize somewhat differently, okay? And I'm happy, by the way, any of you who have questions about what this looks like, whether it's today or three years hence when you're actually in the firm, save my email and I'm happy to get in touch with you and have that conversation when the time comes. But what we can reveal to you now is the relationship between these two different patterns of collaboration for partners who are, remember, otherwise practically identical. We looked at their business outcomes. In this case, we looked at how much revenue was generated by all the clients where they were the billing partner or the lead partner responsible for, for the outcomes. And here's what their outcomes looked like. Twin number two's business outcomes were more than four times higher than his twin. Now, this is just a, a little case study, right? This is just a snapshot in time. Maybe these are outliers, or maybe it's what I heard some people debating earlier, what comes first? Is it a chicken or egg problem, right? Do you just have so much work that you have to get a lot of people involved, and therefore the work comes first, and then you build out your network accordingly? We can't tell from this diagram, but we're lucky because we've built a database with millions of data records. I mean, a decade worth of day-by-day timesheets for multiple firms, right? And we marry those with the billing records and the demographic data and all of these kinds of other things. Now you see why I needed mathematicians and statisticians to help with this. So we join forces and we can now build statistical models where we control for all sorts of other variables that might predict the outcomes. And what we can show robustly over time between firms, different kinds of practice groups, you name it, that collaboration, broader collaboration, working with more partners 
in this joined up integrated fashion produces better business outcomes. They're likely to help you raise your hourly rate faster than your colleagues who are less collaborative. They're likely to produce higher origination or business development fees. They're likely to lead to all kinds of strategic outcomes as well. In the book, I'll draw your attention if, uh, if you're at this point in your career where you're carry, carrying about uh, not just getting a client, but keeping a client, right? What we see in some data that was uh, collected by a US accounting firm, and I'm sure it applies in the legal world as well, clients are more than three times more loyal when they're served by a team versus an individual. And even if that individual leaves, they are much more likely to stick with the firm if they've got a team of trusted people in place. And that team can be as small as two, right? So there's really significant impact on, uh, on client loyalty as well. And, and we've now tested all different kinds of business outcomes, different kinds of career outcomes, um, strategic outcomes for the firm and for the clients and for the individuals as well. It is not all a rosy story though. There are times, as we've been alluding to, when collaboration is not a smart thing to do. If you know the answer and you are confident that you've tested it already and it's a high quality answer, don't spend the client's time and money retesting it, right? That's not what we're talking about. But if you spot an opportunity to do something more innovative, more broad reaching, solving a more complex, higher value problem, that's when we're asking you to think about what collaboration looks like and who's got complementary expertise that you could join up with in order to add that value to clients. So I'm gonna leave it at this. Does anyone have questions? I'm happy to take some, please. So the question was whether this pattern holds for different kinds of professional service firms. The answer is yes. So in our data, we have tested accounting, consulting, law, engineering, and executive search. Um, and we've now uh, done a number of interviews in, in organizations ranging from commercial real estate to medical research um, and software. I think it actually holds even broader than professional service firms. Anywhere that there's the opportunity to have these two forces, right, big broad problems and specialized experts, I think that's how you spot the opportunities for where it's gonna add value. Yeah, please. and how that might affect the dynamic of the network? So the question is, what's the difference between sponsorship and mentorship, and how does that play in here? It's a big, broad question. I think the difference to keep in mind between mentorship and sponsorship is sponsorship is somebody who's actually going to advocate for you, where a mentor is somebody who's going to help you understand the ropes and think through the implications of different decisions and give you some, um, some guidance, um, perhaps, along the way, somebody who's been there, done that. Um, but it may be inappropriate for your mentor actually to be sponsoring you and pushing your career forward over other people. The way it plays into this, though, is twofold. Number one, even with the best network in the world, unless you are able to capitalize on those opportunities that are flowing through to you and understand the implications of how that will affect your perception, right? Is this going to position me better for partner? Um, should I spend my time developing a client or contributing to an existing institutional client? Those are the kinds of things that are incredibly hard for you to know as an up-and-comer. Frankly, as somebody who's really experienced, it's probably hard for you to have a crystal ball and understand it. But if you have a good mentor, that's exactly the kind of question you can ask them is when you've got you know, a, a plate load of opportunities because you have so many connections and a great reputation that spreads so far, helping you to understand the trade-offs of those different opportunities is a great role for a mentor to play. Yeah, please. If you have a client that is accustomed to going to one firm for its great tax department, another for litigation, another for environmental, et cetera, mm. do you counsel that client to get its multiple firms to collaborate, or how do you get it to center all the activity in one firm? Whether to use multiple 
firms. So ex you still need complementary experts, right? And do you care whether those experts reside in one firm or multiple firms? Really depends on the general counsels or whoever the client is willingness to play the general contractor role, right? Because they will then be the one who's playing the coordinator across those different organizations, most likely if they're not in the same firm. What we see now more and more is a push for clients to, I love this word, decomplexify. I mean, honestly, if you were trying to decomplexify, wouldn't you use the word simplify? <laughs> But it's the word that came up again and again when I was talking to procurement professionals who were talking about decomplexifying their vendor base, right? Having fewer firms providing a broader range of services because from a back office and logistics perspective, it's a whole lot easier for, for the client to, to administer that way. That might be one of the reasons they would want to do it. Um, or they might feel that they really truly have the world's guru tax or employment or someone else, in which case they're going to make the demands that those competitors work together. The interesting thing, when I talked to clients, they were much more savvy than a lot of lawyers would give them credit for about how good of a judge they were of collaborative capacity. A lot of people really thought that they could pull the wool over their client's eyes, you know, just kind of meet their colleague in the, um, the lobby uh, and, you know, ride the lift together and, and pull together their strategy for the pitch. And then, you know, we're going to really look joined up at that point. And clients are seeing right through it. And what I find interesting is clients more and more are using their assessment of how well teams, say, of lawyers from the same firm collaborate amongst themselves as a signal of how good they'll be at collaborating when times are really tough, like working with a lawyer from another firm, for example. So collaborative capacity is used not just as a, uh, a way to assess value on a project, but to assess value for future projects as well. I think one more. That is a fabulous question. Can, can these behaviors be learned? Or a lot of people actually think they're sort of born and bred, right? There's a type of person who's collaborative. And if I ask you to think about who's collaborative, you'd probably have like a vision in your mind of somebody who's super charismatic and life for the party and whatever else. I want to disabuse you of that stereotype because there are many, many, many introverts who are brilliant at collaborating, right? So the, the first sort of unanswered question is, can people learn this, is absolutely yes. Regardless of, say, characteristics or, or personality traits, people can learn um, these behaviors. It might come more naturally for some people, admittedly, but people can learn this. Um, in the book, what we do is we pull apart in four different chapters different kinds of actors within the firm. So somebody who is a solo specialist who has gained their reputation by being that lone wolf, I do it all on my own and I'm brilliant at this and all I need is some juniors, their reasons for not collaborating are different than the up-and-comer who's worried about spending her time contributing to somebody else's success, right? How do I, how do I show how great I am what if I become a service partner, you know, dreaded just contributor and not seen as being able to lead these and generate these? Different people have different reservations based on their experience and, um, uh, and um, success rates at prior collaboration. They have different reasons why they might hesitate or what they perceive as barriers to collaboration. Understanding where they're starting from is a really important place to understand how to help them make the shift from one to the other. But Yes, firms are very much interested in trying to focus on professional development kinds of activities from very early stages, ideally, that will help them to become more collaborative. So I'm going to wrap up right now. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'm willing to stick around afterward if you want to engage in more questions. Thank you. Thank you.